Praise the Lord. Praise Hallelujah. The Lord who created the heaven and the earth, he alone is worthy to be glorified. And he has promised us the Holy Spirit is what we were singing. Amen. Hallelujah. We we'll go back to this new series that we've been studying. It's called The New and Living Way. And today we will talk about the next uh, item on that list. We've already had a chance to talk about the reason why we needed something new and what was, pro what was the problem with the old nature of man. And then we talked about the new covenant, the new birth, and last time we talked about the new heart. And today we will talk about the new fruit. The new fruit will be split up into four parts and my portion today is an introduction to this topic and afterwards we'll go through the fruits of the spirit over the next three weeks after that if you'll see and what we've been studying is that the every human being sitting here has a body a soul and a spirit and the soul is comprised of the mind the emotions and the will and uh, it is uh, our desire that uh, and the greatest desire of every Christian, every human being, is to be in the perfect will of God, that our spirit be in alignment with the Holy Spirit, and that our spirit, soul, and body would be uh, in communion with Christ. So the sermon title that I have given today is Abide in the Wine and Bear New Fruit. Abide in the Wine and Bear New Fruit. And we'll go into John chapter 15 for that. John chapter 15. But by a way of introduction, let me ask you, you know, we just had graduation ceremonies. I know the high school graduates have already graduated. Some of you are graduating from residency soon and uh, college and medical school in different places. Um, we see in graduation season all the hard work we put into getting your degree finally paying off, right? All the late night studying, all the memorization, all the group projects. Uh, it's uh, made it into a time of celebration as you're able to walk on stage and, said, uh, and say that you finally did it and get your diploma. Well, Jesus and his disciples also went through uh, an intense three, and a, three plus years uh, where he trained his disciples and he uh, knew that his appointed time was coming. He knew that uh, his end was near. And he gathered the disciples together in the upper room. And we know that uh, he started teaching them some final teachings. It started in the upper room, but then they went outside and they went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, in a sense, it was their graduation ceremony uh, from Christ's seminary, I guess. Uh, and Jesus was the master uh, keynote speaker. And uh, you'll see that in John chapter 13 through 17. It's known as the upper room discourse. If you have time, you can study that. It's the last few words of uh, Jesus be the day before, the days leading up to his arrest and his death um, on the cross. He summarized everything he had taught them and said, there are some things that I want to remind you that you must not forget. These are essential truths that are important. And he warned them of the trials that would be coming ahead, but encouraged them to stay strong in the faith. And if you want to understand the heart of Jesus, Jesus study the upper room discourse in chapter 15 specifically we'll see uh, that Jesus with his disciples was leaving the upper room and he was on his way to the Mount of Olives which is uh, where the Garden of Gethsemane uh, would be and he gives an extended metaphor in chapter 15 he gives an everyday picture of a wine, a wine dresser, dresser and its branches, and that's what we will study today. If you look at the whole book of John, you can see also that there are five self-descriptive statements in the book of John, that is the I am statements. In John 6.35, he said, I am the bread of life. In John 8, 12, he said, I am the light of the world. In 10, 9, he said, I am the door or the gate. 
In 1011, he said, I am the good shepherd. And in 1125, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And in 146, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then finally, the last or the seventh of his I am self-descriptive uh, statements is what we will study today. John chapter 15, verse 1 onwards. So this is part of the upper room discourse as Jesus and his disciples were leaving after the Last Supper in the upper room. And it's very possible that Jesus saw uh, this wine, which is the, br uh, uh, the, the, the branding of the Israelites. Uh, it was on the doorpost. It was uh, kind of like the, uh, the bald eagle of America now, which is the vine. Uh, this, uh, and you see that Jesus... Uh, as he was leaving, could have caught a glimpse of that, or he might be passing through a vineyard uh, when he said this, and uh, it has a lot of meaning behind it. So it is part of the upper room discourse. It's the last of the seven uh, I am statements, and it's the only one which includes the Father in the metaphor. And so we will study this in detail. John chapter 15, um, let's look at first Verse 1 and 2. I am the true wine, and my father is the wine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the wine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 5, I am the wine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing, nothing, no thing. Verse 5 through 10, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and it withers and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So prove to be my disciples. To be his disciples, we have to bear much fruit. As the father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. And if you keep my commandments and you will abide in my love just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. This is a very familiar portion uh, to all of us and we will look into it in a minute. But there are many references in the Bible if you look throughout of bearing fruit. We are very familiar with Psalms 1 that says, Blessed is the man that yields its fruit in its season. In Matthew, John the Baptist called true repentance as fruit. In Matthew 7, Jesus said that the evidence of spiritual authenticity is fruit. And you shall know them by the fruit that they bear. In Romans 1, it says that winning converts over to Christ as fruit. In Romans 6, Paul says that grow, growing in holiness is fruit. In Romans 15, Paul says, meeting the financial needs of your fellow brothers and sisters is fruit. In Colossians, it says that the growth of the church is referred to as fruit. Again, in verse 10, it says that saints would be bearing, should be bearing fruit in every good work. In Hebrews 13, 15, it says that the verbal praise of the Lord is the fruit of our lips. So all throughout the Bible, we see reference to fruit and what is this new fruit we're supposed to be bearing. The, this fruit should be the consuming desire of every Christian to bear fruit for the glory of the Lord. And, and as we just saw, the fruit is the best marker of spiritual maturity. So God is a fruit inspector, and he is going around to see if you are a true disciple ha by having much fruit, if you have true maturity in your Christian walk by looking at your fruit. In a Westminster Catechism, 
uh, that was written in 1646 to 1647. The first of those catechisms is, what is the chief end of man? And the answer that they wrote, many of the theologians, uh, theologians at that time, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever, is what they said. So in that context, let's look at this portion that we read. In order to understand this portion, uh, we need to uh, understand a few things. And the method and practice of uh, tending to grape wines, we might not be very familiar with. I know that uh, most of you guys are farmers, uh, uh, that you have a garden in your backyard and that you're uh, hardworking farmers but I don't think a lot of us have grapes in our backyard. Um, and so this particular study of our method of practice of tending to grapevines is called viticulture, viticulture. And there's a few things that are stated right off the bat, right off the bat. It says that God is the gardener and God wants you to be fruitful. As a Christian in this world, God wants you to be fruitful. So in God's sovereign will, he is the one that plants you where you are. If you think that you were born at the wrong time, into the wrong family, at the wrong place, you are wrong. You were born into the right place or you were moved to the right place. Uh, it is all in the sovereign will of the Lord. So God, as a child of God, we need to understand that God is the owner, operator of this farm that we belong to. God is the one who plants us in different places, in different phases of our life. Whether we move to that place or we're born into a certain family, the Lord is the one that plants us in the places we are planted. God also waters and prunes us in the way that we should go. And we will look into that a little bit more. But God waters us. And we talked about it earlier and yesterday that the Lord has entrusted us to the Holy Spirit. And from the true wine comes the sap, which is the Holy Spirit. And we need to rely on the Holy Spirit uh, that is provided for us. God waters. God also prunes, which is painful many times. If you're fruitful, he prunes you even more so that you can produce much more fruit. Amen. He doesn't just leave you alone if you're fruitful, but he prunes. He fertilizes, and it might get stinky sometimes when you put down the bone meal or uh, whatever else that you put down in your garden. But God also fertilizes us as well. The second truth to learn there is that Jesus is saying that he is the true or new wine and there is, then that begs the question, what is the old wine? And if you study the book of Isaiah and all of the prophecies in Psalms, you can see that the old wine in the Old Testament was Israel. And I wouldn't mind taking you to Isaiah uh, at this very moment and uh, look at chapter 5 uh, to prove that. Chapter 5, the first few verses, it says that... I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard, my loved one who had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of the stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut the wine press and cut out a wine press as well. And he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit, bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more cloud have been done from my vineyard that I have done for you? When I look for the good grapes, why did it only yield bad? Here it is talking about Israel, which was the good old wine. And when he was uh, putting a hedge around it and expecting it to produce Good fruit, it was only producing bad fruit. And then the Lord took the hedge away and it was destroyed. It was trampled. It became a wasteland. It was neither pruned nor cultivated and filled with briars and thorns. And I will 
uh, command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is a nation of Israel, verse 7. So you can see that the old wine was a nation of Israel. If you go to Isaiah chapter 11, uh, verse 1, it says, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from his roots a branch will bear fruit. That's talking prophetically about the Lord Jesus. So the Lord Jesus is the wine, uh, the, the true vine that became uh, the wine for all of humankind, not just for the people of Israel, but for the Jews and the Gentiles alike. Everyone that trusts in the Lord Jesus, we have a, a true wine in the Lord Jesus. So we know that God is the owner, operator, gardener, wine dresser, um, and Husbandmen, if you want to call it, Jesus is the true wine, which is in contrast to Israel. And we are the branches. Do you understand your assignment? Do you know your role as children of God? We are the branches. Many times we try to be the wine stock. We want our own desires. We don't want to be implanted or engrafted into the true wine, Jesus. There's three types of branches that it talks about. Two of them that are abiding. One that is abiding is a fruitful branch. And that one will get what? Pruned so that it can produce more fruit. Then there's a fruitless branch that is also abiding. And then it talks later about a non-abiding branch which is withered and is good for the fire. So there's three different branches there, and it's time that we examine ourselves. If we are a true child of God, our assignment, if you truly understand your assignment, it is to be a branch. Amen. And are we a fruitful abiding branch, a fruitless abiding branch, or a non-abiding branch altogether withered? Are we thriving or are we barely surviving? Are we... Uh, taking our sustenance from the sap, which is the wine, through the help of the Holy Spirit. And specifically, it talks about it in the next few verses that our assignment is to abide in the true wine. It says, if we fail to abide, we render ourselves ineffective. We can only produce fruit when we abide with him and we have the sap of the vein coming in you. So that teaches us not to produce fruit on our own strength. It is futile. In Christ and submission to his Holy Spirit is how we are to produce new fruit. Amen. Amen. It's also curious when you study uh, in the next few weeks the fruit of the Spirit. And it talks about nine different plural fruits. And the S is missing. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's singular. Yes. There's a full list of many things, but those are the collective evidence of Christ being in you. It's almost like you cut open a, an apple and you'll see different layers, but it's all one fruit. Fruit of the Spirit. It's Christ, the evidence of Christ in you. And not only that, going back to the, the points there, there is different levels of production. You know, just like the other parable Jesus said, there's 30-fold, 60-fold, 90-fold. There is no fruit but abiding. There is bearing fruit. There's more fruit. And there's much fruit. And the expectation of the Lord is that we have a, a further abiding in Christ where the sap is coming into our life and then we go from an experience uh, once we're grafted in to bearing fruit and then having more fruit and much fruit an actual dynamic abundant fruit through our relationship with the true vine I was reading a little bit about pruning one of the main components in those first verses Especially verse 5 through 10, it talks about pruning. If you're abiding in Christ and you're bearing fruits, expect to be pruned. The master, the husbandman, the owner, operator 
will come in and he will assess the tree overall. And he will make sure that the central leader is present. A true vine, and that is Jesus. That we're not off doing our own thing. That we're not doing um, things for ourselves. And a prayer life shows that we are truly abiding in Christ. That it, we're not on our own. And that we don't need uh, the, the Lord is what we're saying when we don't pray or read the word of God daily. And rem remember that God is the one that has planted it exactly where it needs to be. Then the B stands for some bad branches, some low-lying branches. And the Greek word here is arrow, like an aeroplane. Uh, it starts, tries its best to lift these branches and try to try it to the trellis so uh, that it will try to grow. It doesn't cut it off right away. You know, there are many branches uh, that are engrafted into the true wine, but they're also low-lying and they're trying to put their own roots into the ground, which is the world. Are we those branches, those low-lying branches that uh, are trying, we're saying that we're hooked up to the true wine, but we're also trying to put our own branches down on earth. Then there's also some competing branches that uh, needs to be cut up so that there is abundant fruit in the branches that will produce fruit. So uh, there is a pruning process which is not very um, pain-free. We'll have to go through pain. The next thing that it talks about is abiding, abiding. The Greek word there is meno, M-E-N-O, to abide or to remain or to stay or dwell. It talks about a dynamic relationship between a disciple and his Lord. Jesus proved his love by his obedience to God the Father and set an example for us. And if you go to study 1 John, the book, First John, you will see that it is, talks all about abiding in Christ. In John, First John 3.16, it says he lay, that we are to lay down our lives just like Christ did. And that is what is meant by abiding in Christ. We as the children of God, as Pastor H.P. Charles said, it is the will of God to have the Spirit of God use the Word of God so that the children of God would look like the Son of God. If we claim to be children of God, we can't look like the neighbor's child. We can't look like the world's child. We can't look like the devil's child. If we are truly a child of God, it is the will of God that the Spirit of God use the Word of God that the children of God will look like the Son of God. And in order to do that, we need to abide in Christ. Abide in Christ. Over the next few weeks, we will talk about the fruit of the Spirit. As the time is going, I will not take too much time to go into that portion, but we will split them into three different uh, groups. The first three, the next three, and the last three, and uh, uh, different speakers will be talking about that in the coming uh, weeks. Let me go back to the grape life cycle. It says that it's not an immediate process, so don't get frustrated, that, that once you're engrafted in, it's usually by year three or so that it starts to produce fruit. What we need to do is make sure that we're digging in, that we're not diseased, that we're not uh, withering away, but continue to abide in Christ. And by about the first few years, we start to see the fruit of the Spirit in dwelling in us. You know, the greatest vineyard wine is in Hampton Court Palace Gardens in England. It's said to be more than 254 years old. It's the oldest known wine uh, branch. And each year it produces 600 to 800 pounds of grapes. You can go see it. And at the time that it produces grapes, you can buy those grapes in baskets and eat it there. It's a tourist attraction is what I understand. 
The world has a wine that is 250 years old, but we have a true wine that is the Lord Jesus that came into the earth, died, and made a way for us, and he left us the Holy Spirit as we've been hearing last week, and he is left us a deposit in us, and we are to uh, tune into that sap and grow daily as we learned in relationship and look more and more like Christ. So the Holy Spirit is not just to speak in tongues or to have the gifts, but to become daily more and more like Christ. One more thing I want to bring up. Um, in Matthew 21, verse 18 to 20, there is a tree that is mentioned. Jesus goes by a tree and curses this tree. It's a fig tree. It had all of the leaves, but no fruit. It had all the expectation, but no satisfaction. In verse 18, it says, In the morning as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing the fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but leaves. He said to it, May no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did this fig tree wither at once? And there could be many different interpretations of this. It was a season, uh, it was early in the season when fruits were not expected, but this tree was looking like it was fruitful. It had its leaves already come out, it was precocious, and it was fruitless. I'm bringing this up so that we can examine our lives. We can look on the outside like we are a tree full of leaves, sap, in, uh, sap coming from the true vine. But if we don't have fruit, then the Lord, God, the Father, the fruit inspector is going around and we might wither away as well. The Lord is looking for fruit in our life. Or worse yet, uh, I was thinking, you know, you see those fruits on the tables that are plastic? If you bite into it, it's just styrofoam inside, right? It just has an appearance of a fruit. It might look good, but on the inside, it is not useful for the betterment of uh, the people around them or for nourishment. The Lord, the fruit inspector, is always watching. So the question for us to ponder as the worship team is coming up, are we truly connected to the sap of the true wine, which is the Lord Jesus? What will happen if we're connected to the wine? We will have an abundance of fruit in our life. And so it's time we examine, are we bearing new fruit in our life? And if you don't bear fruit and just have the leaves or further yet, if you're not even connected to the sap, there is still time before the coming of the Lord to connect with him, to be in constant relationship and communion with him the Holy Spirit, the sap flow through us, but it won't be easy. There will be a pruning. The more you are fruitful, you will go through the painful process of pruning. I know none of you want to be withered and thrown into the fire. And I know that none of you want to just have leaves and no fruit. And if we abide in the wine, that portion that we read said, for sure, in the end, although we have to go through many prunings, we, as long as you remain in his love, we will be able to produce much fruit. So today we looked at the most uh, beloved passages of the Lord and his disciples as he was saying this at the very end of his life, the day before he was supposed to die. It was an extended metaphor with many rich lessons. I want you to go back and understand that Jesus, our Messiah, became the new Israel the true wine when all the, with all the believers in the world being drawn to him. I won't belabor the point, but it's time that we examine ourselves. Am I truly a fruit producing wine, a fruit producing branch, or am I trying to be like a true wine and trying to do things on my own? May God bless you all with these words.